Hello and welcome to episode four of the Menfulness Podcast with me, Sam Watling. We're all absolutely chuffed to bits that people seem to be getting into these podcasts. Um, feedback for episode two with Dan. Dan, I listened to your podcast. It was so good. Really professional. I listen to a lot of well-being pods that are one-to-one and you have an excellent voice over the airwaves. More than that, though, the content was honest and affecting. I thought I understood a lot of what you were going through at the time, but this really enlightened me. But I would have found it interesting, even if I didn't know you. Deserves wider attention. Oh, and who's that from then? Oh, that's from Dan himself. (laughs) Just kidding. Thank you, Annette. Uh, Such heartfelt words. And hopefully we'll get some wider attention. Uh, Now we're just happy that people like your good self are enjoying it. Um, If you are enjoying it too, then please do like, share, follow, subscribe. Your interactions are what push us out closer to the people who need us most. So um, thank you. Um, Now this one here is from... This I don't know who this one is from, uh, but it says, Hey, just listening to your podcast has given me even more incentive to try and set up some kind of small group over here in Ireland. Yes, that's incredible news. And it's exactly why we're trying to do this, because we believe that by talking about our stuff and sharing it publicly, that we can try and help prove that it's it's not a weakness to struggle. And that despite whatever you're going through, we can still aim for progress. Uh, and we give you permission to do that along with us. Um, we're all in it together. So, um, And also, if we're helping inspire people to do great things over in Ireland, then um, that's that's amazing. So thank you for sharing that with us. Kind, anonymous person. Um, so now, in today's conversation, I'm joined by Sinead Tingley, founder and lead counsellor at Serendipity Counselling, who manage and run all of our affordable mindfulness counselling. Sinead has a long history of looking after other humans, and as well as looking after us five who run the charity, she ensures all the blokes who need it get counselling quickly and effectively. After this chat, why not go and visit Serendipity on all the socials and give her some love from us? Uh, If you've been on the fence and are now feeling like you could use our mindfulness counselling offer, then please give us a shout and we will get you in touch with Sinead as soon as we can. Uh, If you'd like to come on here, then I'm looking for interesting people to talk to. So get in touch via the usual socials on menfulness.org. Now, though, it's time for the iconic Sinead Tingley. Thank you so much for coming in, Sinead. My pleasure. Very good to see you. Um, I was really excited to talk to you um, after talking to the founding members because you have provided us with so much support and guidance and you've helped us when it came to you know becoming a charity just I feel like we wouldn't be the organization we are today without you on board so um first things first thank you for everything you do for us (laughs) and for you guys too because you make it okay for guys to come and talk to us so it's a win-win for everyone brilliant um and yeah we thought it'd be really interesting because there's a lot of guys out there who who have had the counselling sessions, but there's also lots who might be thinking about it. There's lots of people who are counselling, um, you know, there's a stigma around that. So I thought it'd be good to talk to you a little bit more about, you know, how you got into it and what it's all about. Um, so can you tell us your journey into counselling? Okay. So I used to work for children's services and um, there was an opportunity to go and work in the, in CAMS, which is the children and adolescent mental health unit lime well it used to be lime trees it's not anymore um in york um as part of the family therapy team to provide practical solutions and interventions to the families who were who were going through the process and during that i was offered the the opportunity to to do some training with them um um following on from that i thought actually i you know i, I, I quite enjoy this therapeutic type of work but i wasn't sure that the the medical model was right for me it, I felt it was very prescriptive and <clears throat> you put people on pathways etc it, it just didn't quite sit right with me um, and then um, working with children young people in my job I had a, I had a young person that I was working with and we recognized that I mean she would have been about 14 15 she really needed some you know some counseling she needed some therapeutic work um, doing so I would pick her up from school she was released from school because school rec- recognized it was more important for her to get the therapy than to do PE yeah. you know on a Thursday yeah. so I pick her up from school take her into town take her to the counselors and she'd go in you know quite sad she was the saddest person I'd ever seen to be fair and it was the only time 
she smiled was when she came out of that counseling session you know finishing a can of pepsi and i just thought everything i've done for you know the family and her like um you know around housing etc all of those things were very really practical but this is the thing that's making her smile every week so i want to do that yeah so um kind of i went back and talked to cams and they kind of said well actually why don't you try you know if you if you don't like if, if this isn't sitting right why don't you try counseling training so that was kind of it. It was kind of working with cams and working with a teenager who I actually saw that you know, like a real positive impact on on a weekly basis. Wow! And how long ago was that then? That would have been about that would oh about t- ten years ago. Wow! About ten years ago it started. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and so once you qualified, then um, you know how did you then become the business owner that you are today with with serendipity counselling? Well, with with counselling, um, it. it so for me my training was th- it was told it was three years of training plus all the, the stuff I did with cams um and you have to do so many hours on placement so I had to do 150 hours on placement plus I was work- still working for um children's services and anybody who's worked in services knows that there's restructure after restructure yeah. so I definitely went into counseling um to be able to be able to offer that to children and young people um, and the wider community, but w- then I kind of thought, actually, no, this could be a new career for me. You know, this could be a career. So I think in my in my last year of training, I start. I, mean, I, I would say people would say don't do this anymore, but I would always say I'm not a businesswoman. Obviously, I am. <laughs> you are now. <laughs> I, I am now, but I, you know, I'm. I wasn't a businesswoman. Um, so in my last year of training, I think it was maybe in the February before I qualified, I started looking at, you know, oh, I might need a website or I might need this. And it was just like, you know, every weekend I would do a little bit of work on building up a business, you know, like mm. what, what, how to set up a business. I had some, um, I had some business coaching through uni. I went to York St. John and as part of the graduation scheme they were offering coaching so I, I took that up and the business coaching and and, and actually I went in and, I, and it was this Scottish guy <laughs> and he was had uh, this really strong accent and he was telling me what to do which if anyone tells me what to do it's like no get off me <laughs> that's go not away. coaching either is it <laughs> no and, and he was like you do this do that and I went home and um and I was ranting about this guy and my husband's like well hang on you know you just he just gave you that advice for free you should do what he told you so I did and it worked. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair enough. So yeah. <laughs> so so serendipity was born. What year was that? Serendipity was born in twenty seventeen. I just I decided not to use my own name. I wanted to to have a practice, and I knew even though it was just me to start with, I knew I wanted to work with people because counselling can be quite lonely if you're yeah. sitting in a room on your own. So I knew I wanted to work with other people. Um, and it was how I was going to do that. So serendipity was, it, it was, I was just trying to decide on a name. It's a great name. It, it is really a great works. name. It really is a great name. And I, I was reading this BBC News report about how people choose their counsellors. You know, if you have ever had to choose a counsellor, you go on um, the counselling directory or find a therapist and it's and it's like being on Tinder. It's like, who do you choose? Yeah, <laughs> by looking at them. Yeah, yeah. Literally, people will look at your profile picture and decide, in like, what is it, 2.0, whatever. Um, and they might not even re- read your profile, they'll just decide on your picture. It's like going on Tinder. <laughs> Swipe. So, <laughs> um, so, I, and so I thought, actually, you know, choosing a counsellor... <laughs> It shouldn't be chance, but serendipity means a lucky chance. It's like a you know something good that's happened by by chance. Yeah. So that's that's, that's where it came from. That's great. And so you now do work with lots of people. I mm. mean, you do different types of counselling, right? It's not just one on one counselling. You do yep. couples. And can you tell us a bit more about what serendipity offers? Um, so serendipity, we can. There are currently twelve counsellors at the moment. We've got five fully qualified. Um, one is a, is a specialist children and young people's counsellor, so she can work with children through art therapy from the age of four. Um, and then um, <clears throat> we can go right up to our eldest counsellor. Our, our eldest client has been about 94. Wow. So we go all the way through. Um, and we So we work with adults, children and young people and we do do couples work and relationship counselling. Um, so not just couples, relationship counselling can be lots of familial stuff. We're currently getting lots of 
adult children wanting to bring their parents into the counselling room. Um, so that's especially, it, it seems as though when um, certain clients reach an age and they have children of their own, they want to go and address things with their own parents. Yeah. So that's been coming through as well in the last year. Wow. I can relate to that. That's, I mean, we're all trying to escape our childhood in some way or another, I, I imagine. So I, I bet that's really, really amazing work. And it's really interesting that that you help people from such a young age, such young children, right the way through, that people are trying to make positive change in their lives throughout their lives. When mm -hmm. I was talking to Jack the other week, he said he believes that we should all have access mm -hmm. to counselling. I do. There's no reason why we shouldn't be trying to make positive change, even if we think we're all right at that particular time. Um, amazing. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, so we'll talk mentalist counselling a little bit then, if that's okay. That's um, okay. Because obviously it's one of those... One of those incredible things that I think defines us and and makes us stand, helps us stand out in what we're trying to offer, um, and so it, it's um, it's the relationship that that we've got with with you, and and I wonder how that started. It was just before my time, I think that that, that all began. So can you tell us, yeah, how it started and what it entails? Okay, um, so mindfulness counselling started back in February 2020. Um, I had worked with Jack. Um, in the in the council for you know for a number of years we'd known each other for a number of years and I'd asked him to promote some <clears throat> an affordable counseling offer we were we were having um, this is when I had my first um, trainee counselor it's actually a friend of mine she's she was doing a PhD in counseling psychology and she needed placement hours she was already a qualified nurse mental health nurse so it's a no-brainer of course come and come and yeah, work with us yeah. um, and so I sent Jack some posters about it and he kind of said, oh, you know, let me come in. So we came in and I, t and I talked to him about, you know, what we were doing and why we were doing it to kind of help help um, Caroline get her hours, but to also be able to offer, you know, an affordable counselling offer to the community. And he came back and it must, I mean, when did mindfulness start? It was just before covid i think it was probably 2019 again it was right. before my time i yeah. came on um in the about the second lockdown third lockdown so right okay um 2020 but it, it had been in existence for a year or so before then i understand yeah it was definitely mindfulness and not yorkie dads yeah. you know so it was definitely mindfulness so he kind of you know we, we were talking and he kind of said look you know we're doing the, this mindfulness stuff and we're doing these, you know, this, I think at the time football was, you know, was going on every week. And he kind of said, look, and we recognise that maybe for every 10 guys that are turning up, maybe one needs to talk a bit more than the others and needs more, a profession, some professional help that, you know, we're here for a chat, absolutely, but they need something more than that. So how about you, you know, you do our counselling for us? And I was like, well, sure, fine, you know. And I remember it's it was kind of like, all right, how many hours? Da, da, da. So <laughs> it was kind of, we did, the first funding came through for mindfulness. Shall I say what it was? Yeah, by all means, absolutely. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Well, you decide whether this goes yeah. out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the first round of funding was like um, £500 and it literally went within weeks. Yeah. Because once, once, I think it was... Um, Jack and Dan and Matty were kind of like saying, we've had counselling, we've done this, you know, mm. um, this is really good, you need to go and talk to somebody. And it, the, the pl spaces were taken up straight away. Yeah. Um, and it was like, wow. Um, and then good old COVID hit. Yeah. <laughs> so COVID hit. And um, that had a real impact on numbers. Even the mindfulness clients at that time, they were like, oh, no, we, we don't want to go online. We'll, we'll come in next week. We'll come in next week. We'll come in next week. Yeah, I found that with coaching, actually, that um, that people were reluctant to do it over the internet. Mm. I suppose it's such a personal relationship and people weren't as used to the video calls, were they? Yeah. Um, so when did that sort of start back up then? When did How long did that last for? So that went, to, I think we reopened face-to-face in the July of that year. So we closed down in the March. We did go online, but there was a, there was a real reluctance yeah. um, for people to, to, to go online. And I think it was only, um, I was, I was thinking about it. It's like, what made it okay? Because I think before we never had an online offer. It yeah. was like, you know, we were face to face. If you were, if a client was going away for work or something, yeah, we'd do a Skype call, yeah. you know, back in the day Skype. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we, we would just wouldn't do online. 
But then I think it was things like, I don't know whether you remember House Party, you know, yes, everybody was on a house party. Yeah. Like literally, I think I looked it up yesterday, 50 million signups worldwide in the first month of lockdown wow. for House Party. And it kind of made it okay to go online. Yeah, yeah. Um, so moving forward, like our numbers literally fell off the cliff. Oh, no. We went to about two clients a week. That must have been really intense for you, especially because you getting started really getting going yeah um yeah yeah God, right yeah numbers just fell off a cliff because people just didn't want the online stuff it did turn around slowly it did turn around and start picking up because i think especially people who um we didn't know what was going to happen so people who were living alone who had you know were really isolated so that laptop or tablet or phone was a window out was, of, yeah know, their in, connection to yeah to people yeah yeah, yeah. Do you, do you still do online then? How much of your what's the sort of split now between in person and online? We do now. We offer it online as a, as a service because yeah. I think um, I had a couple of clients who um, kind of said, "Actually, this is much easier. Do you mind if we do this?" And I was like, "No, okay, that's fine." Yeah. Um, I think the split now would be we're seeing on average fifty clients a week. I would say. On any given week, five to ten of those would be online now. And that yeah. might be because um, their child's ill or they're, you know, they're out of town or they they just haven't got the time to get in and that's fine. So, yeah, yeah. that's that's brilliant. And do you do you notice a difference in the the ability to, you know, to have successful outcomes with the the video calls? I mean, I, I've noticed that it's fine for team meetings. I found it hard initially to, to do coaching and uh, nigh on impossible for socializing um then the the back and forth that you get everything's slightly delayed people talking over each other it's uh, you know I've, how have you kind of settled into that and do you still find that you get the same feedback um i think i think um i think it's because it was the only medium we had yeah. you know for for several months it was the only way you could get, you could access counseling yeah um and I think people, I think people became used to being online, and I think if they felt safe where they were, so if they if they were in a room on their own and that you know, and no one could overhear them, and they started to feel safe, that you could get that connection with them. You could see the difference if somebody was in a busy house. You yeah. could see them listening for doors and stuff. You need uh, to know what you're saying is, is yeah, private, don't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. But I think you can, you know, work can be done online. I I don't feel it's as if effective yeah. as face to face because you miss all that body language yeah. you miss the nuances of what's going on yeah. you know um but it absolutely does have a place now it yeah. really does and i suppose it opens up potentially a, a new customer a bit further and wider you can yeah. co you can counsel for yeah you know people in a different country if you wanted to have you noticed any of that again? no we have as well you know uh, um, i think when the some of the lockdowns um ended in you and some travel was permitted you know mm. we that we did have clients moving around and also we had international clients so this was really strange we had international clients who were from york or yorkshire but living in dubai and australia but were looking for a york counselor and then they'd get me and i'm a londoner <laughs> 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 but yeah. they would you know like literally someone in sydney would be looking for a york-based counselor yeah. online and it was so yeah so we did we did actually go international well, we still are <laughs> it's international for a while that's awesome um cool so so with the mentalist counseling then how many of our guys are you, are you counseling and and how often would you say oh i think i think this week we've i think we have about nine guys in wow. this week yeah amazing and and all together so far you brought some stats with you i see uh, how I, I <laughs> always prepared you did so i think um so since february 2020 um we have to date done 917 hours of counseling <sighs> for you guys <laughs> <laughs> we did have a celebration at a thousand we are definitely <laughs> having a celebration at a thousand so if you average it out you know it, it, it's almost like we offer six th you know through you guys we offer six sessions some guys um you know offer um, will often extend through self-funding um but it's an average of 150 guys that have gone through now that's incredible. I, I, that either have or are accessing counseling 
that's that's amazing to hear. Thank you. Um, and the feedback we've been getting has been pretty much bang on, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. in the ninety odd percent meaningful change. Have you got any stats on that, or or sort of just general feedback on that? I think it, I think it was ninety odd previously because I mean you know that we were working with a certain client group. Yes, that we discovered like having six sessions of counselling wasn't going to help with main, meaningful change because actually perhaps they needed something more yeah. than that. Yeah. You know, um, so when we made the decision to kind of not work, and it was nothing to do with the stats. It was actually six sessions could do more damage than good for these yes. clients. Yeah, um, and that's because they maybe already were accessing sort of more clinical support at that time yeah so that you know so so um people may, who maybe who had long-term mental health issues who yeah. were still under um you know under um huntington house they'd been working with iapt it just you know it it wasn't it wasn't an appropriate referral no. they needed more than what we could offer yeah um so since then moving forward i think you know we definitely i th i haven't got the numbers but but we haven't had any schools go down. So for me, that's 100%. Yeah, amazing. Know? That's incredible. Um, and we, you know, we do get blokes who will come into the WhatsApp groups um, and on the Facebook and say, I've had the counselling, you know, and, and that's great because it, it helps other blokes realise that this is constantly happening. Even yeah. if we're not all talking about it all the time, now yeah, and yeah. again, a bloke will say, I've had it, it's brilliant, it's mm. changed my life. And then that suddenly, I'm, I'm guessing at that point, you probably end up getting a few more in. Um so can you tell us a bit about sort of how it works and, and who, who you might be getting as your counsellor, how that all gets decided and, and what the, um, the journey to a counselling session might be like for a, a bloke? Okay, so the so should I talk about the counsellors first? Yeah, by all means. Yeah. Okay, so from taking on my first counsellor on placement, which, which is Caroline, um, we started getting approached by um, other students and universities to to be a placement provider for their counselling and psychotherapy students. So originally it was Caroline's at Teesside um, and then it was, we, we were having approaches from York St John, Leeds Beckett, the University of Leeds, Coventry, which has an outpost in Scarborough, and even the University of Derby. Um, so had you gone looking? How, how no, did I don't, they, how, I, how I don't, did that no, happen? No, I don't go looking for anything. How they did find that happen me. then? <laughs> I think when I think when I had Caroline um and we and we we did a new website we just put this tag at the bottom you know um we we do have students on placement with us if you're interested in having counseling at a reduced fee please contact us so I think s students saw that and thought oh can I be a student as well yeah. um now I do you know I'm a visiting lect uh, lecturer at York St John so I would, you know, I would go in and talk about my practice and, you know, talk to them about how to set up a private practice. And, and those on placement there would then kind of say, can I come and do some hours with you? So it just kind of grew. And, you know, I, I, I never went out looking for it. The no. students found me and then the then the universities and the agencies would come in, do the, do the visit. You know, all the policies and procedures are in place and we would have the, the students on placement with us. And what a win win because you know it helps you as a business grow but equally they're getting really good practice from somebody who's you know yeah who's been there um and then also people are getting top quality counseling from people who are probably as keen and, yeah. and as qualified as they're going to get at that time yeah um, so they're waiting to actually finish their final year are they they're waiting to yeah so usually they are um so uh, because of the nature of our clients um I, I tend to choose counsellors who have a, a, you know, a background in either pastoral or that have been key workers or have been in services who kind of understand that not everybody has had a, a great life's journey, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, not through lived experience necessarily, but they've worked in services. Yeah. Um, and, and I know when I was um, training, it's really, really hard to find a placement. But I also know when I was in when I worked for children's services, it's really, really hard to find a service for, you know, to, to signpost to because yeah. waiting lists are closed. And I'm thinking, hang on, there are all these counselling students needing placements, all these people, people needing counselling. Needing counselling. <laughs> yeah. And, the you know, just get more rooms, do, yeah. you know, work longer hours, do Saturday mornings. And I'm not saying work 24 seven, but do you know what I mean? It's yeah. kind of like the counselling rooms could be used all day long. Yeah. So why don't you, 
you know, why don't people do this? And I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. Wow. You know, it, so the, the ethos is, it's it's kind of like, um, you know, it, it's just a win-win for everybody. Yeah. The unis are happy. The students are happy. The clients' needs are being met. Yeah, well, the feedback, like I say, the feedback's been incredible. Um, so clearly the quality of counselling is is, is, in, is amazing. So, so all, yeah, so all the counsellors, you know... So all the all, all the counsellors have a, a really good background of working with people in one in, in, in one way or another, whether it's pastorally or however, um, and they've all um, been they've all been signed off as qualified to practice by their universities or training agencies, and in that they are all uh, they're all insured. They've got their own professional indemnity. They're all supervised by a more experienced counsellor. Plus, they get supervision through their uni. And that's where they get to talk through their work to make sure that they're keeping themselves safe and only working with issues they 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 feel able to. And they're keeping their clients safe as well. Yeah, because I imagine it's the sort of job where you do take on... It must be hard not to take on some of that emotion um, when you're doing it all day and immersing yourself in people's grief and struggle. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, uh, to be fair, with the counsellors, when they start, we normally, I normally just give them one or two clients for the first, you know, few weeks, maybe until they're comfortable. Yeah. Um, usually within two or three months, they're up to three clients a week, and that's where they'll sit. Yeah. Um, and it's it's when they get signed off, usually in you know well into their second year, that they can start maybe doing four or five, maybe six clients a week. So that you know, so in they training, build up. yeah, they build it up. It must be amazing for you to see them that because you get to see some of their journey and then them sort of qualify and and move on to their own. Yeah. So we've had two we've had two students through, one from York St John and one from um, Leeds Beckett, who've done all of their counselling placement hours with us. Um, they came on, so they qualified. They came on board as associate counsellors, so qualified counsellors where they were getting paid, yeah. and then they've gone off and set up their own practices. I'm well, happy for them. That's awesome. And Caroline, who was stuck, was the very first one. Has literally just competed. She needed four hundred and fifty hours. She's done her four hundred and fifty hours. Most wow. of those men for us, I have to say. Wow. <laughs> um, and so, yes, yeah, so she's going to be a doctor of counselling psychology. <laughs> you know, awesome. so that's like I'm, that's re- awesome. I'm so happy about it's that. Just an, an, an extra bonus to yeah. know that it's um, it's helping people in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we, we call it affordable counselling now because for a while we were doing it as free counselling weren't we mm-hmm. and I think you kind of um, helped streamline that a little bit and, and after our last meeting I think we, you talked about possibly doubling the number of blogs that we were able to help and um, can you tell us a little bit about that how that works I think so what uh, what happened in the beginning was you you know it was promoted as free counselling yeah. and part of that was great because it it removed any barrier, you know, you know, yeah. someone, oh no, but I can't afford it. You yeah. said, no, you don't have to afford it. We're here, give it to us, you can have it for free. Yeah. So we were getting, you know, lots of guys coming through, not because they were, you know, it was because it, having it for free reduced and took away another barrier, okay. Yeah. But then we kind of recognised, okay, this guy's got a Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we never, we never asked the question before. We never asked the question, but if you can afford to self-fund, you know, that's an option here. Yeah. As soon as we started saying that, um, because I would never, ever want to embarrass anybody into talking about their finances or anything like that. So now it's kind of like, you know, the boys will, sell, well, the boys will fund you for six sessions, but if you can self-fund, the sessions are £25 each. And suddenly lots of guys were going, oh, yeah, no, that's fine. I'll pay for yeah. them myself. No, that's absolutely fine. And it's only because we asked the question. We yeah. never asked it before. I'm sure the guy in the Tesla would have gone, oh, yeah, no worries. Yeah. Well, well, he might have been living it. in his Tesla. We don't know, do we? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I understand what you mean. I think, And I think that that's really important is that actually it, it was free for the time that it was right to be free and while we were trying to understand what the barriers yeah. really were. Yeah. And actually... F- Finance isn't a barrier for everyone, um, and it means the the coaching, the counselling goes a lot further now. Yeah, it, it certainly does. I mean, the f- the funded places are absolutely still there, and it and it's just a oh yeah no I'll take the funded or no I'll self fund, and then yeah fine okay then that's the end of that conversation. There's yeah. it, you know it's literally a really simple if you can that's great, and if you can't that's great too. Yeah, and that's part of your initial consultation then. So yeah. will you tell us a bit about how what the journey might be like from one of the lads telling us they they 
could do with some counselling and, and actually getting into some sessions. OK, so what happens is a referral. Will, so the, usually what will happen is you guys refer someone into us. So you've got consent and we get a phone number or an email. Um, I will contact I will make contact, you know, with the, with the potential client saying, you know, let me know when you're free and I'll give you a ring. Um, sometimes there's a bit of to and fro because, oh, I can only talk to you at nine o'clock tonight and well, I don't work at nine o'clock at night, you know, yeah. so, that, that, so there's a bit of to and fro in there. But I'll make contact with a client. I'll talk to them about, um, you know, what they'd like to talk about, what, you know, what the issues they're, they're experiencing are. Um, so I talk. I talk to all of the menfulness referrals that I'm the first point of contact. So I will triage, triage the, f- the first phone call. It was a triage and the general assessment, like, okay, what's going on for this guy? And um, what does he need from us? And, and also who's going to be best placed to meet his needs. So, um, you know, like, um, his availability. So then I'll take that information. I usually send out an intake form, which is asking for a bit more information about a little bit of history, what's going on for them now, um, etc. And then I will look at the counsellor's availability. And if a client, a potential client is prepared to be flexible, you know, if, they're, if they've got flexibility in their availability, I can usually get them in within a week. If a client is saying I can only do nine o'clock on a Tuesday morning, they may have to wait a little bit longer because yeah. if that slot is already full, I can't oh, get that's them in. Understandable. Um, but so, but a week, within a week is yeah. incredible, and and you know, I, I guess a lot of people can take an hour out of their schedule if if they want that support. That yeah, quickly. I guess it's what it, you know. It's it depends on you know it, it depends on a client's circumstance and what and what they do. If if in most workplaces now will release someone at the beginning or the end of the day or give them an extended lunch yeah i get that some people won't want their work to know that they're they're seeking counseling but most places right. would say look you know you have a you have a late, late lunch get yourself off at three half three you, you're fine you know? yeah because they recognize that this is meeting the need yeah, yeah. The welfare of staff the between yeah. them staying in work and not yeah absolutely um so okay. then they'll, so then they'll come in um so so we'll confirm appointment days and times etc paperwork goes out confirmations go out they get reminders and then they come in the counselor meets them takes them into the room um and then what they usually have um to start with a contracting session it's kind of like you know this is what you're here for this is what i can offer this is the day and the time how many sessions safeguarding confidentiality and that's really important because whatever that client talks about i mean i have the presenting issues but whatever the client talks to the counselor around in their room that stays in the room you know it's completely confidential um, the only reason a counsellor would have to break confidentiality is if they felt the client was at risk to themselves or others. Yeah. But then we talked to the client about how, you know, where we would go for additional help. So yeah. the sessions are confidential. That's amazing. And and um, the where you are now as well, we've been for a couple of meetings with you there mm-hmm. and it's um, it's gorgeous. Your um, your offices are, are lovely, aren't they? Well, tell people where you are and, uh, and, and when the move happened and how that all came about. So we had to move. We were in the middle of town. Um, and the building we were in was grade two listed and they got a massive grant to replace the roof in October. And I'm thinking, oh, that's going to be noisy. But they were like, no, no, it'll be fine. <laughs> and then it started <laughs> and the scaffolding took them six weeks to put up oh, and it God. wasn't fine. So we knew we had to move. We had like, anyway, it was just a nightmare. Um, so we were lucky enough. And I do think this is serendipity again. OK, um, I literally went on line on a Friday off you know the end of the day like offices to rent in York and the first floor offices at Heworth Golf Club had come up that day um, and it was three really lovely looking rooms potentially our own entrance so I you know phoned the agent up and they were like oh you know yeah come and have a look come and have a look and I was away that weekend so my husband went to to look at it on the Saturday I went to look at it Monday morning and we'd agreed it by the end of Monday because you know <laughs> and it's almost like I walked into what is now my office and it was it was in De- uh, was it late November early December and I looked out across the golf club and uh, the golf course and there were deer at the end and I was like you've rolled them <laughs> out on purpose yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> to sell the place. But it does. It just the the lighting feels right. The whole place feels very calming, and being right next to all that. Yeah, greenery, it's lovely. It's, just, yeah. it's really lovely. It's really discreet. We've got our own car park. It's a mile from town. It's just you know, it's a it's lovely. Yeah, that's great. And and so what. What's a typical session like? I mean, some people will have no idea about counselling. So, you know, how would you describe what counselling is and what people can expect, um, you know, to be asked? Well, counselling, very simply, is a talking therapy. It's somewhere you can go to talk to somebody that's not a family member or a friend and who is there, you know, just for you, you know. Um, It's what you can expect in your session you come to the door you ring the doorbell your counsellor toddles down the stairs and says hi brings you up and you go into a room all the rooms you know they're really kind of comfortable there's armchairs there's throws you know that we try and make them as comfortable as possible not clinical at all um and the session will start usually with your client just your counsellor just asking you how you are how's your week been or um and then you know it would be you know what would you like to talk about today you know what's going on you know so it the work is client-led it's not our agenda we, yeah. we're not there to say or oh, tell us about xyz it's like what would you like to talk about what's going on for you yeah and the counselor really simplistically helps you understand your thought processes under help you helps you to understand why you're having the emotional response you're having to certain things whether it's people or situations um to make sense of it all um and because if you can understand what's going on for yourself and why you're acting the way why you're relating or behaving in a certain way it gives you different choices yeah you can you can choose to do something but you can't choose to behave differently if you don't know you're doing it of course Does awareness that make sense? brings change yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely so it's you know the most important thing in the counseling room is the relationship the client has with the counselor yeah um, because that's where the that's where the work comes from. And it's very privileged, isn't it? You're kind of getting to really understand someone and their life and mm-hmm. their their struggle um, yeah. within a few minutes of meeting them. And it's... yeah, I think I think counsellors people just want to disclose to you. Yeah, you know they want to sit. You know, them. I think once somebody sits with you, once a client sits with you, and they feel safe and they feel like actually this person is here for me. Yeah. Um, they're here they're here to listen and really hear what I'm saying and help me understand what's going on and help like is, sometimes you get tell me what to do no <laughs> <laughs> we're not here to tell you what to do we're help we're here to help you decide yeah. how you might want to do things differently it's not for us to say don't do this and don't do that it's completely non-judgmental you know it's kind of like we're there to to facilitate and support you on your therapeutic journey I think that's that's where the magic is, isn't it? Is that's that the magic. Pe- if if you tell somebody what to do or what you think of them, mm. usually there'll be some resistance to that or disagreement. They're not going to get the wording right. Whereas mm. if someone articulates it themselves mm. and they own it and they might never have said it to anyone before, I, mm. you know, I guess that's where the light bulbs start coming on. Yeah. Um, we we have we have this hashtag. You'll have seen it on all of our posts. Don't man up, speak up. And I think just in our groups, what we realise is that there's a, a weight off just by saying it you know you don't always need an answer to it sometimes just a bit of time to with people who are not judging you to say what's going on it has a bit of a an effect in itself you know do you find that that people sometimes just need to offload yeah i think um what we what i look what we all all counselors have seen is if a if you can get a client to a place where they're really engaging they're really engaged with you um, and they, and again, it comes about feel, feeling safe in the room, that they yeah. feel that this space, they can say anything and they're not going to be judged. It's almost like at the end of the session, they stand up and they feel lighter. Yeah. Because they, it's almost like they've given, they've, they've given some of their stuff to you. Yeah. And in doing that, they feel lighter. Wow. Honestly, you, yeah. you physically see it happening to clients. And that's amazing. Yeah. That's just so amazing when you see that. What we what we find sometimes with male clients is a, re, a reluctance to go there. They really need to feel safe in that room. Yeah. Um, and it can take two or three sessions to really for them to 
for there to be a breakthrough and that's around the relationship that they finally or feel okay I'm going to give this person this my stuff yeah because it is don't matter you know it's like all oh, this don't man up yeah you know yeah. or like you know just like shush be quiet put you know, crack on get a grip just get, get, yeah all, all right. of that all yeah. of that and actually that is you know no yeah. don't, don't do any of that talk to somebody yeah you know because I think the difference between girls and boys is that, you know, like you, you'll say women will talk to each other. Girls will talk to each other. You know, they'll go la 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 and they will offload and it helps. Yeah. Boys don't tend to do that. You might have the banter on which then will quickly turn to the football or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yes. You won't have those more meaningful conversations because you don't want to be a burden to your friends or you yeah. don't, you know, um, so so with with male clients we do see that sometimes it can take a few sessions just to just to break through with the relationships that they really feel safe to to be able to articulate how they're feeling yeah you know absolutely yeah i mean we we try to advocate i've had counseling myself pre you know not mindfulness counseling not through serendipity but um you know 10 years ago and i know jack um and uh, as as talked about he's um, journey with counselling and how that's helped him and, and as I say we've had several blokes not anywhere near 150 so again that confidentiality there is just because you've accessed it through one of us it doesn't you know there's no expectation that you have to talk about it at any of our other events or, or, or spaces um, but when it does happen it seems to be that um, generally blokes have got it in them to to talk yeah and it's just getting through that door and 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 trying to accept that um one step at a time you don't have to offload everything all at once um mm. so yeah that's that's amazing have you what barriers have you found then to people um get into coaching um you know especially around men and you know do they do some of them ask for a male counselor or a female counselor have you found that actually men are better counseled by women or is there anything around gender and, and stuff like that i have never been asked about the gen occasionally with some um female clients they will specifically ask for a female counselor yeah. but i've never been asked by a mindfulness client whether i'm whether they're getting a girl a ma man or a woman right that's interesting yeah yeah good um so obviously what we what our hashtag what we're all about is getting that stigma um and understanding it and trying to reduce it in some way so you know we we can see that we're getting blokes in um to counseling is there how do you think that is working do you think there's more we can do how do we approach this on a wider scale and get blokes generally to to talk to each other and to counselors I think mindfulness have done a cracking job of making it okay for people to access counselling. Because if one of you guys says to, you know, one of your guys, do you know, I've been there, I've done that, and it was all right, you know, they'll go, oh, okay, then I might give that a go. And I think you make it okay by saying, also, you know, it's like, oh, Sinead's all right, just give her a ring, you know. But just by saying something like that, it kind of, it makes it okay for guys to go oh, okay i'll give i'll give it a go yeah, you know is that 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 is like such a big deal yeah. that you guys make it okay it seems so straightforward as well doesn't it it's yeah. just that letting people know you've done it and you can talk because uh, we, we get blokes coming to some of our talking sessions where they won't say anything for the first week or two, or month or two. Um, there you go. So and, you get it as well, and don't then, you? <laughs> yeah. And then once they've seen other people talk and share and how yeah. the responses have been for them, um, that's great. Thank you. Um, have you noticed any trends? Because we, we were talking a little bit earlier with the coaching. Um, I've noticed that often pe people, regardless of how different they might be, there's there's underlying issues that seem to be the same for all of us things like perfectionism and procrastination fi help finding motivation self-limiting beliefs you know not 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 believing that they can succeed or, or or change um and and i've always found that really really interesting how similar we all really are have you found any of that um with the coach with the counseling and and particularly with the men's counseling if you can talk about it um so i think if we were talking about what themes of why people are coming into counseling, yeah. it can often be around relationships, whether that's, you know, work relationships, personal relationships, friendships, familial stuff. 
Um, so relationships that are maybe going wrong or people are finding themselves in repeating cycles of behavior, yeah. you know, oh, this always happens to me kind of thing. You yeah. know? So the, the, there's that going on. And I think with counseling it's kind of like okay let's unpack why you're why you're responding like that you know what's going on that this always happens because again if you can understand what's going on you can choose to do things differently moving forward yeah, does that make sense of course yeah um we do we see a lot of people coming in you know like especially since lockdown anxiety like f people in low mood um, stuff you know but it can be very situational if your relationship's not going great it's gonna it is gonna have an impact on your mental health yeah. that doesn't mean to say that you're depressed if that makes sense you know but something situationally is having an impact on you yeah um and you know if work's not going well it starts to affect you you can feel stressed you know you you can't switch off when you leave work you're thinking about it overnight you're not sleeping yeah. you might have a lo loss of appetite and all of that these are all signs actually that you you're not in a good place yeah. and and i think counseling is a really good place to go get help to yeah. you know straight away yeah absolutely um i mean you you it's with covid and the lockdowns and the effect that must have had on your business i can mm. imagine that you've been through it yourself like like many have over the last couple of years um do you find yourself counseling yourself can you counsel yourself do you access counseling through another counselor um, how how does that relationship work for you being the counsellor and always trying to help other people? How do you get help? Um, so c all counsellors have something called supervision. It's where we go and talk to usually a more um, experienced counsellor. Um, so I see... I ha have supervision twice a month. So every couple of weeks I'll check in with my counsellor and I have an hour and a half each time. Um, and I will talk about my work. Um, I won't it's, I won't talk about my clients because they remain confidential if that makes sense. But yeah. I might say I've, I'm doing this piece of work and, you know, I, I need to work out why is it having the impact it's having on me, etc. Or it may be that I'm working with something and it's kind of like um, it's having an impact on me. And it's like, why am I why can't why can't I stop thinking about this thing? You know, I need yeah. to, you know, so, yeah. So that's, you know, c counseling the counselors. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But that's really good to know that, mm. you know, if you do take stuff on, you, uh, you've got an outlet for it too. You've got to keep yourself in a safe space. It, it, you know, if, if, um, if I have a, if I have a tough session, um, I can, I, I can access my supervisor She's really good. I can just drop her a message and say, look, I need to talk about this like today or tomorrow. Are you around? And I can have a quick check in with her. And that puts it in a holding space till my next session, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And what about um, what about the, the impact then on your business over lockdown? How did you cope with that? You know, where your clients have dropped off. You've got a, a new business that you're excited about. You know, what did you do during that time? How did it impact you? So I'm, I got COVID in the March, so I kind of went down, I, I did, I went down for two weeks anyway. And then when I was um, back working, that's when, you know, the numbers had gone, the numbers had just gone. And I think it was, um, it was, it really did have an impact. It, you know, I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> fine. So you do it too. <laughs> Pretend everything's fine. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, you know, like I had um, two boys at home and there was a seven years age difference. And to be honest, over lockdown, they they just reconnected that, you know, it was almost like my eldest would say to the little one, when did you grow up suddenly? And, and they got really <laughs> close over lockdown, which was lovely to see. And my husband was at home as well. Um, so I think, you know, being at home, it was lovely weather, etc. But then the novelty wears off, kind yeah. of thing. So I started going back into my office just to have the space. That, you know, um, the Wi-Fi was better. That you know, in there was some charities that were still running that were doing like breakfast and stuff. So I kind of bacon sandwich, yeah. <laughs> all outdoors. Yeah, yeah. But finding people to connect with and getting yeah, back. finding people absolutely. Um, but you know i was in the middle of town and it was like a ghost town yeah you could York, really see the difference again okay? mm. and i remember having my first um my first supervision session in lockdown and um my and it was on the telephone obviously it was on the telephone and my supervisor's like oh hi Sinead how are you and i said like, oh yeah i'm fine and she was like Sinead and I'm like mm? and she goes 
come on and that was it i am not a crier okay i'm not and i was just like blubbing oh. absolutely blubbing and i think it was because i am a people person yeah and i wasn't seeing um my family my girl had moved in with a boyfriend they you know it's just, not that i'd lost her but you know she yeah. was living somewhere else i wasn't seeing my friends and family even though i was seeing them online it wasn't the same like i wasn't getting yeah, I was getting hugs from the boys and everything, but it just wasn't the same. Yeah. And I really, really missed it. Mm. And and I didn't realise how much of an impact it ha, ha, it was really having on me. Yeah. Plus this kind of like worry about the business. Um, and when <laughs> when the numbers had dropped off, obviously the income wasn't coming in, and we were in we had offices in town, um, and. And I knew, I, like, after, I, I thought, well, you know, I can go so many weeks on this, but then actually I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. And everybody was like, well, just get your rent deferred. Get your rent deferred. Everybody's doing it. The council's doing it. You know, yeah. don't worry about it. But our office, so our offices uh, were at the back of the Central Methodist Church yeah. in town. So I had to write this email and it was like asking God not to pay <laughs> my rent. Oh, no. <laughs> it's really i was just like i'm so sorry can i please defer and they were so lovely yeah. they were like absolutely don't even think about it we'll deal yeah. with it after the madness yeah so they were really lovely and that was like you know um so i think once i sorted myself out financially and knew it was all going to be okay um it was it was better but it really did you know i i i, I did not see, i did not see that session with my supervisor coming um, but she knows me. She uh, knows that just me. shows that even the most experienced can, you know, can still bottle it up a bit. And, oh, and absolutely, because it's like okay, I, you know, this is this, you know, we'll just crack on. But and... you're managing kids, family, global pandemic, business, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then someone finally says, "Are you all right?" And that's that's enough, isn't it? Well, she asked twice. Yeah, yeah, asked. yeah. <laughs> she did. She could. I think she could hear it. She yeah. could hear. It. She knows me so well. She yeah. could hear it. And she asked twice and that was it. Yeah. And I didn't know I was going to do, uh, but it was such yeah. a release to be able to do that. And then once you've done that, I suppose, then you can be, because when you are holding things, you're not always effective at the other stuff as yeah. you as you want to be. Yeah, and yeah. look what you've done in, in just, I mean, we're only a year or so out of COVID really. Mm. Um, and the business looks like it's doing incredibly. I mean, just from your social media presence, the partnerships that you continue with, you seem to be everywhere, Sinead. Uh, <laughs> tell, tell me about that. Like, what else is going on? Do you know, that's you guys as well. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is kind of like, I think when I started out, I was just like, obviously not a businesswoman, but I didn't have socials or anything. Literally, I didn't. Um, and I went on a few women in business courses and I did have the socials, but I, what I didn't have... And I think this is Mr. Woodham's. <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't have was the confidence you guys had in just putting stuff out. Yeah. It was like, what? what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Um, and I think I really struggled with how to present and and how to um, kind of show showcase what we did yeah in a way that felt okay to me you know that it was you know self-care you know look after yourself um think about this and you know n n not around chasing clients or anything it was more about what can i give you here i think people recognize authenticity don't they if you're putting stuff out just to get more customers it's not why people are on socials yeah whereas with your content um it, it does there's tips people can learn about themselves a bit people can 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 learn about what you're up to but it definitely feels like you is it you you that does yeah. The is, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I I so. did, we did have um we did have a sixth former who was doing psychology and she had to do 20 hours of voluntary work so she did some of the um she did some of the socials that was 18 months ago yeah but as part of her course yeah. um so that was quite sweet yeah. Um, but yeah it is usually all me but it literally it's, it's time consuming isn't it there's five it of us really... chipping away at hours and you, you've got you've got you so. yeah but half the time I just repost what you've done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's lovely. And, and for people listening, um, you know, if they want to follow you, you're on all the socials and, and what about your website and, and what have you? Yeah, Serendipity York. Um, that's the tag for all the socials and the website. Brilliant. Um, and so for blokes who who want the counselling through mindfulness, um, then, you know, you can talk to any of us trustees, as most of you know, we, we're constantly banging on about the, the counselling, uh, but also equally um, through the website mindfulness.org. Um, what about if 
you know, there'll be people listening to this who, who aren't from mindfulness or who, who have heard that you're talking about, you know, children's counselling or couples counselling. How can people, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you direct? Oh, take a look at the website, serendipityyork.co.uk. There's um, lots of information about counselling, frequently asked questions, bios of the counsellors um, and, you know, how to get in touch with us. Give us a ring or drop us an email. Incredible. Um, so finally, we do like to ask people um, if they've got any content, songs, podcasts, books, anything that they might have that's, um, you know, impacted them in a certain way. And we're just trying to kind of build up a little bit of a... Uh, database of things that, that have, have helped our guests is there anything that you've got to share or something that makes you happy I think with um, I, uh, just talking about content I think you need to be mindful of the content you take on because I know for myself especially over lockdown with the socials given the nature of my work you can tell the kind of things I'm going to be following and stuff but I recognised that actually I needed to moderate that during lockdown, that I couldn't take it. Yeah. So I got rid of lots of, you know, I changed who I was following, etc. And I started, you know, because I thought, no, I need to, to feel good here. Yeah. I need to feel good. So I literally started following like puppies of Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and I became obsessed with those pandas in China where they're so naughty, they were still the brushes. <laughs> yeah, to I, know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I became obsessed with them. And I just thought, you know, like, this is making me smile every day rather than this heaviness, you yeah. know. So with content, be careful, be mindful of what you're watching or what you're listening to or what you're seeing because it can have such an impact on your you know your mood yeah so you know if you, you recognize that if you're listening to like thrash metal <laughs> that can actually create anxiety yeah <laughs> you know it's sometimes it's people's release to that anxiety too yeah though. absolutely you know, it's the way that people yeah um vent it um but i, I think you're right i read someone had said you you, you sometimes have to hack your own socials feeds mm. because actually mm. depending on what you're going through and the people that you follow and the friends that you have what they're sharing you can find yourself down rabbit holes and and what have you whereas actually like you so say if you if you are searching for pandas and <laughs> and puppies then that's what these socials think you want to see more of and, yeah. and they will share that yeah, yeah. it seems simple but it makes so much sense well especially you know with the socials we you know we do work with a lot of young people and a lot of students in york um and they, the be, you know, how people benchmark themselves against the socials, you know, we all recognise that actually only the good stuff goes out on yeah. it, really. Yeah. Um, so just be mindful of you, be mindful of what you what you're listening to, what yeah. you what you're seeing. I think for us, um, I think what we what we try and do is if we if we recognise that clients are saying, oh, I've just read this book or I've just heard this, then we'll kind of like, oh, okay, we need to know what's going on here because more than one client has referenced it. Right. So recently, um, what our clients seem to be looking at um, is is it Dr. Julie Smith on she's TikToks. Oh, oh right. Yeah, she's. I think she's a psychologist, psychiatrist, right. or something. Um, and she's written a book. Um, why has no one told me this before which is real kind of self-care real like practical tips of how to manage anxiety what to do in certain situations she i mean she's great on tiktok yeah um, oh, we've not we've not got onto tiktok yet are you on tiktok are you no all right J <laughs> just a consumer at the moment not well i think that's where she launched her brand if that makes sense right. but now the books come out and you know we've, we've got a couple of co copies in the office and we're all skimming it and it does what it says on the tin yeah. it's just like you know here, here's a you know you you're feeling this try this um kind of inspirational um books that go uh, another book that's going around is 101 essays that will make you that will change your life and these I don't, have you heard of that one no it's kind of like um a, it's a collection of essays that are insightful offer a different perspective on on things um and just give you food for thought so these are like um academic no papers no, no just, no, just no, no no literally you know like i think the um the julie smith one is, was like a n number one sunday times bestseller right. it's like it'll probably be at the front of waterstones yeah. if you yeah, walked yeah. in you know yeah no that's that's brilliant um excellent thank you very much indeed it's okay i think that's everything yeah. aside from just again just a, a huge thank you to what you've done for mindfulness and uh and and generally i'm excited for this partnership to continue um and I, I can say I know you've helped a lot of our members. So on behalf of all them, 
Thank you very much indeed. It's been my absolute pleasure. Nice one. Thanks, Sinead. Cheers. Cheers.